I am so excited to be with you today. I feel honored and privileged, and I'm just so encouraged by you already. I haven't even started. And you know what? It's kind of fun, right? Last week, we got Matthew Povey, our youth director. This week, you get me, young adult director. Who knows who you're going to get next week? But uh, you know what? Don't have to worry. You only have to worry about this week. All right. So of course, as Derek mentioned, uh, one of the things I do here is I'm the young adult director. So I've been with that ministry for 12 years now, over half of which I've been on staff. And you know it's great, right? They're my friends. They're my peers. I get paid to have fun. I mean, it really doesn't get any better than that. Now, the young adults is kind of an interesting age group. Many of you have been through that already. Some of you are in the midst of that. But there's a lot of change that happens during those years, right? You're doing university. You're starting your jobs. You're moving. You might have 10 roommates, for all you know, right? You're deciding if you want to be part of church. You decide how involved to be a part of church. You are deciding who to date, who to marry, and more importantly, who not to marry. <laughs> That's one of the most decisions that, that come out of that time. And what's so great about this age group and why I love it so much is because there's a huge amount of spiritual growth that happens during that time, right? Because they're deciding about their faith. And it's oftentimes for the first time they're really having to, to conf confront this themselves. Is this something I want to make my own? And I find it particularly funny when you're 18 years old, right? Because everyone's asking, what are you going to do with your life? You know, what's next for you? What are you going to be when you grow up? And <laughs> it's all this pressure. Meanwhile, three months ago, they had, had to ask a real adult to use the bathroom. You know, it's a bit of a clunky transition into young adulthood. And I, that's just part of the reason I love that age group. But I want to talk about this idea of spiritual journey, because we're on a spiritual journey, right, as Christians. It's not just young adults. Everyone is becoming more like Christ, hopefully, right? We're on this journey to become more like Christ. So how many of you like adventure movies or adventure stories? Yeah, that's your preferred genre. Yeah, lots of us, lots of us. You know, one of the most beloved adventure series is Lord of the Rings, of course, right? And every time I see those movies, I think, oh, that looks amazing. I want to go on an adventure like that. I want to be the one running across, across the cliffs of New Zealand with heroic music playing in the background. It's inspiring. It's epic. And it's, it just stirs up something in you. And you know what, in 1949, there was a guy by the name of Joseph Campbell. He's a writer and a literature professor at Sarah College University. Sorry, sorry, Sarah, Sarah Lawrence, there we go. Sarah Lawrence College. Anyway, he put up a book, and I'll throw it up on the screen here. It's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And what this book was, was it was a template for adventure stories, right? Because if you think about it, most adventures have a similar template. So he called this the monomyth, mono being one, myth being story, because it was one story that he saw being repeated over and over and over again across culture, across religion. You've got the picture of Jesus on there because his story also follows it across eras. So it was more popularly known as the hero's journey. So I've got a slide of what that is that's going to pop up right away. And let me just take you through it real quick. This is the hero's journey. So you start with our hero, our protagonist, you start in the known world. It's comfortable, it's lovely, but nothing really changes. And it's the Shire, for lack of a better term. So at some point you've got the call to adventure. And it's, you've got to take the ring and destroy the ring, whatever it might be. And at this point you can either accept the call or you can ignore the call. But if you accept, you continue on this journey. And about halfway down there, you see that there's a mentor. And a mentor specifically helps them move from the known world into the known world. They equip them for the journey that they're about to make. So they go through a series of challenges, temptations, trials, failures, and they make it to the bottom there. And I'm just going to just pause on there right <laughs> for a moment because you see it's death and rebirth. That's the climax of the story where the hero has the big battle and they overcome it. And there might be a death and rebirth uh, that might be literal, such as in the story of Jesus, or it could be figurative, right? Death of the old man and putting on the new man. At that point, you have won and you go through this transformation process. You go back home as a changed person. So that's the hero's journey. And you know what? Our spiritual journey also follows the hero's journey. And in fact, we might cycle through that dozens of hundreds of times in our life because we are constantly being made into the likeness of Christ. 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the 17 steps that Joseph Campbell uh, talked about in the Heroes Journey. <laughs> Just kidding, you already know I'm not going through 17 steps. It'd take us hours. I have simplified it to four, and they are the call, the coach, the challenges, and the change. I know what you're all thinking. Boy, is she like her father. I get it. <laughs> I get it. So the first one is the call. And this is the most important step because it actually starts your spiritual journey, right? And the call can come in a bunch of different ways, a bunch of different forms. It can come through preachers or teachers, come through friends, family, maybe blog, co uh, blog posts or articles that you read, podcasts, or maybe the Bible, for example, that's a good one. Maybe revelation through prayer. There's a lot of different ways that we receive a call. And I'll give you a few examples here, what that might look like. Because what it really is, is the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, that I need to do this. It's a conviction, it's a hunger, or maybe it's just an interest. So for example, you hear a story about you know, quiet time with God, and you think, oh, I need to work on my quiet time with God. What does that look like for me? That would be a call that you can accept or decline. Or maybe we've been talking about prophetic ministry in this church, right? And you think, oh, I would love to learn about prophetic ministry. You know, that's an interest of yours. That's a call as well. Or maybe you're a parent, and you think, I don't know what biblical parenting looks like, and I want to be the best parent out there. That's a call as well. And all of these things look very differently from each other, but they're all spiritual calls. We're becoming more and more like Christ through these calls. And God is calling us to grow all the time. He's wanting to journey with us, and we can either accept or ignore these calls. So I'm gonna go through the story of Abram, also known as Abraham. And we're gonna start in Genesis 12 here. Let's uh, read it together. I'll just read it, you just follow, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now, if there's one thing that you can take away from this passage, it's that you are not too old to grow spiritually. 75 years old, and he's really just starting the journey at that point. He's not even close to the end. So the call, it's, it's an invitation to journey spiritually with God. Right? And of course, Abram has a literal journey. He's going from the known world into the known world. He doesn't even know where he's going. But there's also a spiritual journey that he's going on to trust and obey God. Now, I know each one of you has had a call, at least one. And do you want to know how I know that? Because the first call was the call to salvation. Right? That, you remember that moment, right? When, when the Holy Spirit pressed upon your heart I need to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. You felt the need and desire to do it. That was the first call. And for some of you who haven't made that decision yet, you haven't accepted the call, and we're gonna have an opportunity at the end of the service to do that, because you're here, you're, you're listening. God has called you here, he's brought you here, he's wanting you to accept that journey. And that's just the beginning though, right? Because we continue this journey through our entire life as we know it. So this reminds me of a little story. A man called up his friend, and instead of getting his friend, he got the answering machine. And the answering machine said, hey, thanks for calling me. I'm sorry I missed your call. I'm making some changes in my life. Please leave a message at the beep, and if I don't get back to you, you're one of the changes. <laughs> And that's kind of our story with, with God. God is calling us all the time. It's up to us whether we pick up or not. So what is God calling you to? What has he placed on your heart recently? Because that, he wants to journey with you and he wants you to accept that call. So that's the first thing, we've got the call. It starts our journey and hopefully we accept. And that brings us to our second point, which is the coach. Now the coach isn't necessarily the one who presents the call, but they're the ones who equip you for the journey, right? They equip you for the next step so that you can even get started, really. And uh, I'll give you an example. 
So last week we had Matthew Povey. He spoke on how to, like strategies to connect with God. And one of them was a worship soak. How many of you, that was a brand new idea, this idea of a worship soak? Okay, just a few of us. Okay, everyone, wow, amazing. It's a pretty new concept, I will say that. In a worship soak, some of you heard that and you thought, oh, well, whatever, that's cool, I guess. So you didn't really have a call for it. Others of you heard that and you thought, oh yeah, I like that. I want to do that. And you went home and you did it. Or you left the building and you forgot about it entirely. <laughs> that would be ignoring the call. But Matt did two things. He presented the call and he equipped us for the call. He was our coach. He was our mentor last week uh, for those 30 minutes that he was preaching. Now, I am... I know a lot about coaching. I have played on sports teams all my life, basically. I was a coach for several, several years. I know a thing or two about coaching. And here's the thing about a sport or a team in general is that you can only get so good without a coach. Your potential is limited without a coach. Now, my sport was volleyball. That was my thing. I, I started when I was 13 years old. I played school. I played club. I played provincial team. I actually got a full scholarship to play university volleyball, and I was the starting setter my very first year. So I know a thing or two about volleyball. And volleyball, it's interesting. It's an interesting game. I know some of you know about it. And I was a setter, which is a very specialized, very technical position. And not every coach knows how to coach a setter. I'll be pretty upfront with you. But my very first time that I had a coach who knew how to coach a setter, I was 15 years old. So I'd been playing for a couple years, and that year elevated my game. I won't lie. I went from an average setter to a top tier setter. I learned so many skills, and honestly, I think I can contribute that year to the success I had down the line because of what I learned from my coach. Now there's a bit of a caveat to this story because, and I say this with as much love and respect and as delicately as I possibly can, but for lack of a better term, my coach was a complete psychopath. <laughs> they were absolute, crazy doesn't cut it. They were a bit psychotic. And you know, rem I'll remind you, I'm 15 years old, I'm playing on a 16 year old team, and my middle aged coach, every practice, would swear at me and belittle me and discourage me. I actually don't remember a single compliment I received that year. And I'm not a particularly emotional person, but I remember going home and I would cry after every practice. It was soul crushing. And I nearly quit volleyball that year. And I'd really just begun the journey. Let me contrast that to another story. So I did manage to continue and made it through that year. I swore never to play for that coach again. And in university, we had a guest coach come in. And he was this rival university coach from BC. And so we would play his team regularly. And he put on a setting clinic. And of course, I'm a setter, so I had to go. I had to check it out. So I had this coach for two hours. And for two hours, he gave us everything he had. He was fantastic. He gave us as much skills as he could manage to give us. And he was respectful. He was encouraging. And I remember him pulling me aside near the end of the practice. He's like, Danica, I just, I just have to say this. He's like, you were such a talented, such a skilled setter. So like, if you use the skills I taught you today, you'll be able to beat any team, including my team. That's how good you are. And I want to encourage you to continue this journey of volleyball. And I remember walking away from that practice thinking, I want to play for that guy. You know, I want to be on his team. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? How amazing was that coach? And you know, it's amazing because I had dozens of coaches, and the one that made the biggest impact was that guy who I had for two hours. Isn't that incredible? And here's what makes a coach great. Of, co of course, a coach needs to know something, right? They have to be a few steps ahead of you in order to actually coach, but they need to have relationship, right? They're actually part of your team. A coach is on your team, and you want to have a relationship where they respect you and encourage you in the journey, not discourage you whatsoever. 
So Abraham's not a great example for this because his coach was God. <laughs> and, you know, I'm happy for him. That's great. We don't always have that luxury, though. <laughs> you know what? There's a better example, I think, in the Bible. And it's actually two of my favorite characters. It's Elijah and Elisha. Uh, and this is in 1 Kings. But just for context, Elijah was at his very lowest. He was ready to die. Lord, take me up. I'm done. <laughs> There's nothing left for me to do. He's a bit of a drama king, to be honest. And the Lord spoke to me and said, no, you're not done. He says, I'm going to give you two things to do. The first one, I want you to anoint some kings, whatever. The second one was, I want you to find Elisha and make him your protege, which is what he did. So I'm going to read the passage here. It'll pop up on the screen. 1 Kings 19. It says, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the ox and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he turned to him, Go back, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Elisha recognized the opportunity to have the prophet, Elijah, the man, as his coach, and he took it. And you know what? He didn't just take it. He burned his bridges. He could not go back to his old way of life because he was so excited to have a coach. And you know what? Elijah must have been a pretty good coach because Elisha went on to do double the amount of miracles that Elijah ever did. So here's the thing when it comes to our spiritual journey. We need a coach. That's, it's as simple as that. Our potential as Christians are limited without a coach. And I actually really like the way Pastor Aubrey puts it because he says you don't need one coach. You need a constellation of coaches. He's very ethereal about it. And <laughs> you need multiple people in your life who are spiritually ahead of you that you can draw upon. Because everyone has different spiritual gifts and spiritual talents. And so you have to have a bunch of people that you can learn from. So we've been talking about one side of this, and this is finding a coach, but we also have to be coaches, right? As Christians, we're, we're called to both. And I just want to give you one benefit of being a coach, and this is still with Elijah and Elisha uh, in 2 Kings now. It says, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Now, I know what we think about coaching or mentorship. We know, this is how we imagine it. We think, okay, I have to find someone. I have to invite them over to my house. I have to feed them. I have to pour all my wisdom, and I get nothing in return. And that's not the case, right? Do you think Elijah was also encouraged in his spiritual walk from Elisha? Oh, I think so. Did you see that relationship? Did you see that loyalty? That is what a coaching relationship should look like. You are on a team together, journeying spiritually. And one of the questions that always comes up is how do I find a coach? Or how do I find someone to coach? And uh, it's actually not that difficult. I'll give you the secret sauce, how to figure that out. And it's a very simple process. The first thing is find someone you like, not someone you hate, someone you like. All right, step one. And then determine, okay, are they two steps ahead of me or are they two steps behind me is spiritually? And, then, and that, that's it. You've decided, okay, they could be my coach or I could be their coach. It's that simple. And then just start asking questions. Honestly, start asking about spiritual things and you're going to start this discussion, start this relationship that is so beneficial to both of you. It's really as easy as that. And as I look around the room here today, actually, I've been here my entire life in this church, and so many of you have been coaches to me, and you don't even realize it sometimes because you have poured into me over the years. You have encouraged me, and you have built me up to continue in my journey. 
and there's more of you, I'm just pointing out a few of you, but you know what, it's actually quite easy, whether it's you know, a year of coaching or just two hours of coaching. That's all it takes to encourage someone in their spiritual walk. So who are the coaches in your life? And who are you coaching? I want you to think about that. All right, so the first thing is the call, right? We accept or we ignore the spiritual call to journey with God. And the second one is the coach who helps bring us into the unknown and helps us in our spiritual walk. And the third thing is the challenges. Who loves a good challenge? You know, you just want to overcome. You love the satisfaction of it. Yeah, okay, a lot of us. How many of you love failure? Yeah, I can't wait for my next medical crisis. I can't wait for my next soul-crushing event. Yeah, yeah, not very many of us. You know who would have put up their hand? Was our beloved Pastor Keith. You know, if something wasn't going wrong, he wasn't doing it right. <laughs> and I say this actually with so much love and respect because he actually really understood this concept I'm going to read in James 1. Let me read it. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And Pastor Keith kind of understood this concept. If something wasn't a challenge, if he wasn't failing, he wasn't growing. That's kind of what it came down to. Now, when we look at Abram, Abram had a lot of failings, didn't he? He, he sure did. But his most famous one, of course, was he was promised a child, and he wasn't getting the child, right? It wasn't happening. And what he did was he thought, you know what? I want to skip the challenge. I don't want to wait anymore. I'm done. I want to skip right to the reward. So instead of waiting, instead of trusting God, obeying God, he impregnates his wife's servant instead. And that turned out beautifully, didn't it? No, <laughs> no, no, it didn't. It was horrible. It was, it was messy. It was terrible. Uh, but he made more mistakes than that, actually. Uh, in Genesis 12 as well, him and Sarah go down to Egypt because there's a drought. And he's so afraid that his 65-year-old wife is going to be so beautiful, so stunning, that everyone will want to kill him so they can take his wife. And first of all, kudos, kudos, Abraham. That's exactly the way you should think about your wife. Uh, but his tactic wasn't quite as good because he told everyone that Sarah was his sister instead. Now, of course, what ends up happening is Pharaoh thinks she's available, and so he takes her as his wife. And it's it's messy. <laughs> it's real messy. And you'd think after that, Abraham had learned his lesson, right? Right? No, he doesn't learn his lesson. He does the exact same thing again in Genesis 20, and it's a disaster all over again. And it's honestly a bit hilarious, right? When you read the story, you think, Abraham, what are you thinking, man? Right? What an idiot. But <laughs> you know what? We mess up all the time, and we do stuff over and over and over again. We think, what am I doing? I'm an idiot. And, but you know what? This is all part of the process, right? Because we actually need challenges. We need failure as much as we hate it in order to grow spiritually. There was this amazing story in 1958. There was a preacher by the name of David from small town Pennsylvania. He opened up the newspaper one day and he saw seven teenage boys were on trial for murder. There's a newspaper clipping that will come up on the screen. And that's him on the right side holding his Bible to the preacher. Anyway, he's reading the newspaper and he thinks, I've got to help these boys. I feel called to help these boys. And so on the weekend, he packs up his stuff. He drives the eight hours down to New York City to this very publicized trial. And uh, he's thinking, I'm going to help these boys. And so he goes. He wants to help. He wants to advocate for these boys. He approaches the, the judge. And the judge freaks out because the judge thinks that he's in cahoots with this teenage gang. He thinks he's going to threaten him. And before he can even really get a word out, the judge throws him from the courthouse. And the press love it. They, they're taking his picture. And they're like, who's this preacher? How, how is he connected to this teenage gang? And it totally goes sideways on him. And uh, he actually nearly loses his ordination over the whole thing. So he returns home, wasn't able to connect with those boys, so discouraged, right? What a failure. And so he lets it settle. He's, he thinks, you know what, maybe I misheard God. I don't know. You know, a few weeks pass, and he still has this desire 
to help these boys. And he's like, you know what? I still think God is calling me to help these teenage boys. So he goes back to New York, New York City, and he's actually not able to connect with these boys uh, at all. But he's on the street one day, and this teenage boy comes up to him. He's like, hey, aren't you the preacher from the courthouse? He's like, yeah, yeah, actually, I am. He's like, I like you, preacher. You're trying to help out my boy, Billy. And they start this conversation. And this teenage boy, turns out he's also part of a gang. And, uh, and he thinks the preacher is his ally, right? Because he saw the newspapers. He think, and he thinks, oh, he's got notoriety just like me. So they start this conversation, they really hit it off, and the teenage boy ends up bringing him back to the hideout, introducing him to a whole bunch of other gang members. And this preacher is able to preach an influence to these group of boys. And he keeps coming back to New York, he's never able to connect with the original seven, but he ends up expanding his influence within these teenage gangs in New York City. And he's exposed, he starts to realize, man, they need some real help, right? There's gang violence, there's domestic violence, there's drug addiction, there's alcohol addiction. And he thought, I think I can do more. Think I can do more. And as he builds his influence, he ends up starting a little organization you may have heard of called Teen Challenge. And what's so interesting about his story is that his original call, it didn't end up panning out, right? But he needed the call and he needed to fail so that change could happen, right? We need failure, it's part of our journey. So that's the third point. We've got the call, we've got the coach, we've got the challenges, and that brings us to the change. Now, quick poll here. How many of you have been to the Rocky Mountains before? Fabulous. Okay, keep your hand up if you have driven there. All right, lots of you. Oh, amazing, fantastic. So we would used to go skiing in the Rocky Mountains almost every year, and we would drive out there. Man, that's a tough journey, isn't it? It's just cow after cow, fence post after fence post. And, you know, nothing against Saskatchewan. You're just easy to pick on. But it's tough. It's a tough journey. But then you get there, you see those mountains, this beautiful, lightly snowing, this incredible atmosphere, and you go skiing, and you think, oh, this is way better than Spring Hill. You know, it does not compare. <laughs> but here's the thing, you actually can't go skiing in the Rocky Mountains if you don't make the trip to get there, right? And when God calls Abram to journey into the unknown, it's interesting because he actually tells him what the rewards will be. Do you remember them? He, he tells him that he'll be a great nation, he'll be blessed, and that uh, his family will be blessed going forward. So here's my question. If Abram had not accepted the call, wouldn't, didn't want a journey with God, would he still have received those blessings, that reward? No, he wouldn't have, right? He, he has to accept the call because the blessings actually come out of our journey with God. It's not, we can't skip any part of that. If we accept the call, if we learn from our coaches, if we persevere through challenges, he will change us from the inside out. He'll reward us in ways we can't imagine and we'll go places we never thought we could. It'll be such an amazing journey. And I wanna end with 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 here. It says, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The Lord is calling you. Will you journey with him? Let's stand together. Uh, now, I talked a lot about call today, the call. And as I mentioned, the very first call is the call to salvation, right? And some of you are here today, and you have that tug on your heart, and you thought, I think, I need to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I need to start that journey, that spiritual journey with him. So with everyone's eyes closed and heads bowed, I'm just gonna give the invitation to those who would like to accept it. Is there anyone here or those joining us online who would like to make that decision, accept the call to follow Christ? And just raise your hand if that's you, if you're in the room. Thank you, all right. Well, we're gonna pray all together. And uh, so we don't embarrass anyone or single them out. And uh, just repeat after me. So, Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you. I have heard the call to follow you. 
and today I accept it. I declare you as my Lord and Savior, and I can't wait to journey with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.